whole life, Ryan Quarles has been serving and leading. He was elected to public office in 2010 to serve in the Kentucky House of Representatives. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Um, must have a delivery. <laughs> It's a big cheer for you, Ryan. <laughs> he was elected to public office in 2010 to serve in the Kentucky House of Representatives until he was elected Kentucky's Commissioner of Agriculture in 2015. He's now serving his second term. Under his leadership, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture has started several new programs, including initiatives to combat hunger and connect Kentucky farmers to new markets. He supported the expansion of Kentucky's diverse agriculture portfolio to include industrial knopf, hops, and hemp, leading to the historic rise of Kentucky's industrial hemp program. Due to his Kentucky Hunger Initiative, Kentucky now has the strongest food donation immunity law in the nation. He continues to find bold solutions and opportunities for farmers to grow and expand domestic and international trade. On the national level, he served on the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture and serves on President Trump's agriculture advisory team. Commissioner Ryan is a ninth generation farmer growing up on his family's farm in Scott County. He's wicked smart. Um, he's graduated from the University of Kentucky with three undergraduate majors and two graduate degrees. In 2008, he was awarded a full scholarship to attend Harvard University. And after graduating with a master's degree in higher ed, he returned home to finish his last year of law school at the University of Kentucky. And he also completed his doctorate at Vanderbilt University. So please join me in welcoming my friend and yours, Commissioner Dr. Ryan Quarles. Ryan? Thank you so much, and uh, it's an honor to be here today. You know, usually this is when I say thank you to those who not only prepared our meals, but the farmers that grew it as well. And uh, I hope as much as you do that we're back in person uh, to do this again in the very near future. But today, uh, I'm honored to be back with you. I wanna talk about a couple things that are Louisville specific, and then talk about food insecurity and the hunger initiative. And so I'm gonna make sure we have plenty of time for questions at the end, and I will be as uh, brief as I can, but be thinking about what you wanna ask. Uh, happy to, uh, to answer anything about cows, plows, or sows today, okay? Um, Louisville is a special place for Kentucky agriculture. In, out in rural Kentucky, a lot of times people think, well, this is where agriculture is really the big part of the economy, and that is true. But a lot of folks don't realize how big of the Louisville economy agriculture is as well. And so let me just mention a few things. Uh, Louisville has 343 farms right there in Jefferson County. And even those out in the farm community are always surprised to learn, oh my gosh, there's over 300 farms. And they farm over 20,000 acres. Uh, most of it is crop land, but about one-fifth of Louisville's uh, farmland is devoted to uh, animal agriculture, livestock, et cetera. And here's probably one of the coolest things. Uh, on those 340 or so farms, Louisville farmers bring in over $6.3 million uh, in direct cash receipts off those farms to the Louisville economy. And, and that's bigger than some of the smaller rural counties. So just putting that in perspective. And here's perhaps the coolest statistic that we found about Jefferson County agriculture. There are 594 farmers. Now, some of those admittedly are part-time farmers, but nonetheless, they're out there working, they're rolling their sleeves up. But of those 594 farmers, 234 of them are female, which makes 40% of all the farmers in Jefferson County female, which is one of the highest in not only Kentucky, but highest in the nation. And it's reflecting the trend that a once male dominated occupation is actually, uh, if they're in Louisville, 40% female, and that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. And so things are changing down the farm, and Louisville has a special place because have any of you all raise your hand if you've ever been on a farm all tractor, seen an old farm all tractor? This is about as idyllic of an antique tractor you can think of. 
Well, guess what? They were made in Louisville, the Farmall A's and B, the little Cub tractors. A lot of people forget that, that Louisville was a tractor producing um, a city all the way up through uh, post-World War II. Louisville is also home to three of Kentucky's and the United States signature agriculture events. Uh, number one is the National Farm Machinery Show. Every, every February, and we were able to do it this year before COVID, uh, the pandemic shut down the rest of uh, our economy, but we have what is the equivalent of the Detroit Auto Show for tractors right there in Louisville. 300,000 people come to the fairgrounds to see what's latest and greatest about John Deere or Case New Holland, and it's always during Valentine's Day. And so if you ever want to, if you ever want to have a romantic uh, getaway with your special loved one, go look at tractors in downtown Louisville uh, with, your, with your partner. It'll be a very romantic evening for you watching a tractor pull. Uh, another signature event that we have in November, and we're still going to have this, we're going to pull this off, is the North American International Livestock Exposition. This is the biggest purebred livestock show in the world, in the world. And in fact, it usually brings people in from all around the globe because it's where they're, it's where they're uh, buying and selling genetics. Uh, they're trying to improve herds and we export cattle as far away as the sedan every single year. And a lot of it has to do with Louisville, Kentucky. And finally, the Kentucky State Fair. And I know that a few of us were talking about this before we kicked off the meeting, but the Kentucky State Fair is usually in the top three in the nation. 600,000 people come by on a normal year. Um, if you ever attend the Kentucky State Fair and you walk away hungry, that is your own fault because you can find bizarre foods from all across Kentucky there. Um, if in doubt, just deep fry it. And it really is a big deal for rural Kentucky because you have a lot of 4-H and FFA members uh, come to Louisville once a year. And, and for a lot of those kids, it might be their first time in your town. And it's always a big, not only tourist attraction, but it's an economic driver for the Louisville area. Now, due to COVID-19, it's no secret. We had to make some major adjustments this year. Most other states canceled their state fair. They just straight up canceled it. Here in Kentucky, we decided, let's do something for agriculture. And uh, as of today, uh, we are going to have two major events uh, during August 20th through the 30th. We're going to have a livestock show. And we're going to have the World's Championship Horse Show for the Saddlebred community. And you can watch these online if you'd like to. And what makes this special? Well, Kentucky is a big county fair state. We have 120 counties. And we have 93 county fairs. And so a lot of these kids get the opportunity uh, to raise livestock, learn the responsibility that it takes to take care of another animal and then show them. So a lot of these kids you know, they had their summers robbed from them. And, uh, and the same thing with sports, et cetera. And so as we try our best to uh, get back to what normal is going to be, a lot of these kids need the opportunity to show their, their, their cattle, their swine, uh, their sheep and goats, uh, rabbits and uh, chickens. And so we have 600 acres of prime real estate right there next to the airport. We're going to spread out. We're going to spread out only those who are participants and parents are going to be allowed on the property. And we're going to have a really nice livestock show following social distancing, following CDC guidelines, masks will be mandatory. And, you know, if we can pull off some summer sports. We can pull off a livestock show. And for me, as a commissioner, I couldn't be more proud that we're not going to have an asterisk next to 2020 when it comes to Kentucky State. We're going to give these kids uh, something to look forward to. And on the last night of livestock showing, we have what's called Championship Drive. And that's where our farm community, uh, Kentucky Farm Bureau or other major ag institutions come together and donate usually around $50,000 in scholarship money for Kentucky's uh, agriculture kids. And so we're going to continue to do that. And we're going to make sure is, we're going to make sure that this runs as quickly as possible. Now, the transition, we're going to have the World Championship Horse Show. It'll be right there in Freedom Hall. It's going to be online. One of the cool things is that the Championship Horse Show already has a large internet following. So we think it's going to be a success. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the Kentucky State Fair. It's still a fluid process, but given the spike in COVID cases, we want to make sure that we're very cautious. 
We want to make sure we do it right. And the good thing is that my department has held over 20 livestock shows in the past six to eight weeks, and they, they, we pull them off pretty well. And uh, so we're going to make sure people follow the rules. But it's going to be a different state fair. I wish I could say, come on out. But this is the year we're going to say, stay at home, get your internet fired up, and uh, help support these kids. Now, I'm going to transition and talk about food insecurity. And there's a lot of different things here uh, that I'd like, like to cover. So please uh, have some questions ready. Back in February and early March, when we started to really get a, a better handle of what the impact of COVID-19 was going to be, uh, we started a flurry of phone calls with the White House and the governor's office that if shutdowns were going to occur, we need to make darn sure that agriculture is considered essential and is exempt from any shutdown executive orders. And so both with Department of Homeland Security, the United States Department of Agriculture, and the, and the governor's office, when other areas of, of, of Kentucky's economy shut down, we made sure that as long as you're following the CDC guidelines, you're open for business. And why is this so? It's a simple concept. If you like to eat, you are part of the agriculture economy. And less than 2% of the population feeds the rest of America. And so it was so vitally important that our farmers had the ability to get out in the fields. A lot, March is a planting month, April is a planting month, to make sure that they're able to be unencumbered, get out in the fields, put the crops in the ground, and keep our livestock markets open so that people can be fed. You know, my, my hat is off, my heart is out to our frontline workers. Every single day, they're on the front lines keeping us safe and uh, helping us through this global pandemic. But it's our farmers who are gonna keep us fed. And if you look throughout the course of human history, whether it's economic collapse, natural disasters, armed conflict, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of times whenever you have big events like that, big disruptions, famine follows um, natural disasters or global pandemics. And so we are determined that here in the United States that no person goes hungry, that we have the safest, most abundant food supply system in the world. And we want to make sure that every Kentuckian, regardless of where you're at, community, county, or city, knows that if you need a little bit of extra help putting food on your table, don't hesitate to reach out. And so one of the first things that we did was work with JCPS, as well as the Kentucky Department of Education, to get a waiver uh, from the federal government so that our kids, our school kids, had access to free and reduced lunch and breakfast. Um, and this was one of the big wins. Kentucky is one of the first states to get this eligibility. We're really proud of our partnership with JCPS, as well as our other public schools across the state, so that our cafeteria workers, our food service directors, uh, had the ability to legally hand out food to a parent that may be coming out and drop, it off, drop, up, drop off homework and pick up meals. And that was a big deal for us. Another thing that we did in rural Kentucky is that a lot of our school bus drivers, instead of driving the routes to pick up and drop off kids throughout the day, turned those bus routes into food drop off points. So that the, the fact that one in five Kentucky school children are food insecure, and in some of our counties, 100% of the students qualify for free and reduced lunch. We want to make sure they knew that they had access to breakfast and school lunch throughout the remaining of the school year. And so that was a pretty big success for us. We're proud to work with our educators on that. And then the transition to the summer months, we have what's called summer feeding. And Louisville is actually one, one of the gold star uh, uh, exemplars when it comes to how to help uh, have food access throughout the summer months. And so we worked once again for school systems. There's over 2,000 summer feeding sites throughout Kentucky. And so for our school kids that, that are learning at home and then had a summer uh, of uh, you know, reduced activities, and maybe that, maybe that camp that they were supposed to go to was canceled, we once again made sure that we had food available for them. And we spent a lot of time in Louisville passing out meals. We actually had farm credit at Mid-America, which is based right there in Louisville as well as CoBank, donate money to renovate about a dozen school buses into what's called summer feeding buses. And so we took the seats out and put cafeteria tables on the inside. We put uh, uh, refrigerators inside these buses. And so they're making routes across Louisville as we speak today, delivering meals. And as we transition into the fall, 
uh, with what looks like it's going to be a delayed um, in-person learning. We want to make sure we have a flexible a flexibility to make sure we provide meals for our kids. And, and food insecurity is big. One in seven Kentuckians are food insecure. And what does that definition mean? It means that at some point throughout the year, you may not have access or may not be able to afford a meal uh, for, your, for you or your family. And food insecurity affects two populations more than others. Number one, it affects children. It affects children uh, because obviously they're not the ones going to the grocery store or sadly they're not the ones going to the convenience store uh, to go grocery shopping. And secondly, it affects the elderly. Uh, and, and one reason why is that there's a stigma involved with food insecurity. A lot of times people are unwilling to admit, I can't afford food. You have to make that choice between medicine or food, et cetera, et cetera. But here in Kentucky, we're doing a pretty darn good job of making sure that even during a global pandemic, people don't have to make those choices. We want to keep you fed. And so one thing we started back in 2016 during my very first year in office was called the Kentucky Hunger Initiative. And this was a simple concept connect Kentucky's farmers with our food banks and strengthen those relationships. And over the course of three years or so, we changed Kentucky's law. We now have the strongest food donation law in the country. And, and why do we need this legal change? Well, we found out that there were some grocery stores in Kentucky that were actually throwing food away in a dumpster because they were afraid of lawsuits that, hey, we want to donate this food, but we're afraid someone might sue us. And so for us, the, the, the safest thing to do is just throw this food away. And we said, don't do that. We're going to change Kentucky's law. And now we, we have the strongest food donation law in Kentucky. And these grocery stores that once were throwing this food in the dumpster are now safely providing it to our food banks. And Dare to Care, by the way, Brian Riendo and the crew out there, Dare to Care, amazing. They're doing things in Louisville that, that they're pulling off there they can't do in other parts of the state. I went through a couple of their facilities earlier uh, in July. A great, great organization. Please help them out. Another thing that we did at the Hunger Initiative is that we have a great Kentucky Proud program. I know we have a couple. Uh, we have Mikey on with today, who's a farmer himself. Hopefully, you all visit our farmers markets. They are open for business during the pandemic. We have 160 plus of those in 115 counties, and we consider our farmers markets no different than grocery stores. And so, we have social distancing rules in place. We had over $13 million in farmer's market sales in 2019. And guess what? We know the sales are going to be way up in 2020 because a lot of Kentuckians, including myself, we're spending a little bit more time in our kitchens and cooking. Uh, I'm meeting off my backyard garden. A lot of Kentuckians um, who may not go to restaurants because they're shut down or reduced capacity are actually cooking again once in the kitchen. So why not buy Kentucky Proud? And so we think that 2020 is going to be a really signature year for local agriculture and buy local because Louisville is also known as a food des destination city. All you have to do is go, go up and down Shelbyville Road, Barstown Road, and see wonderful restaurants that are buying local, they're supporting local farmers, and they're putting it right there on the menu, the Kentucky Proud symbol, which is so powerful. And so for us, the silver lining of COVID-19 has been a greater appreciation for Kentucky farmers. And secondly, uh, support for local agriculture. And we, we hope that buying Kentucky Proud is not a fad. We think, we hope that it's something that's permanent. And so hopefully we have some Kentuckians out there that, that are making the most of this pandemic, spending a little bit more time at home and buying Kentucky Proud. But one, one of the things that, that really put some stress uh, on us was our meat shortages. Go back, go back to April. Remember when you went to uh, the grocery store and you couldn't find toilet paper? Or, um, or paper towels now, or perhaps there may not have been a, a fully stocked meat shelf. Well, the food supply system in America is very sophisticated. It's very sophisticated, but we're not without our weaknesses. And so when some of these Midwestern-based meat processors had COVID outbreaks, the plant shut down. And any, and any temporary disruption at a meat processor causes a ripple effect throughout agriculture. It causes two things. Number one, uh, our livestock producers in Kentucky are taking it on the chin. We have people who are raising livestock, particularly cattle, that are losing $200, $200 per head right now in 2020. And that's a big deal because cattle is a billion dollar industry in Kentucky. 
38,000 uh, Kentucky cattle farmers, who are the biggest beef cattle state in East Mississippi. So there was tremendous loss on uh, Kentucky's farm so far in the livestock industry. But the second thing it does is that it causes short-term supply disruptions for grocery stores. So back in April, back in May, uh, perhaps early June, if you went and say bought ground beef, you saw that the price significantly was higher. This is not due to the grocery stores, it's due to short-term uh, supply disruptions. And so we are actually investing a million dollars of Kentucky's tobacco settlement money. This is money we got when Kentucky made a legal agreement with the cigarette manufacturers and Kentucky gets money every year. Part of it goes to health care, part of it goes to early childhood development, but half of it goes to Kentucky agriculture. And so we've, we've uh, really stepped up to the plate and for all the mom and pop meat processors in Kentucky, we, are, we have a million dollars of grant money to help encourage you to expand your production. So we're really hoping that Kentucky Proud takes off during uh, COVID-19. And we're focused in uh, making sure that Kentucky farmers have the ability uh, to sell products in their own backyards. Another thing that really, really had a magnetic effect, a uh, magnitude effect was with our restaurants closing. Uh, a lot of food that's being processed right there in Louisville, well, it's not meant for the grocery store. If you're a restaurant tour and you're buying milk, you're not buying it a half gallon at a time. You're buying it 25 gallons at a time. You're not buying steak, a one steak at a time. You're buying a whole side and you're maybe cutting it up, um, cutting it up uh, right at the restaurant. And so we had to have some transition between our restaurants being closed. And so we're finally working our ways through that. And I hope, I really do hope that we can open back up safely here in the near future. But back to the hunger initiative. Um, I'm really proud of our farm organizations and our farmers. They stepped up to the plate. I just mentioned how much loss some of these farmers are experiencing on the farm, but their generosity couldn't be bigger. And so due to our work with our Kentucky uh, food banks, Feeding Kentucky, as well as the Hunger Initiative. When March of 2020 rolled around, we knew people were gonna lose their jobs. People may have a hard time putting food on their table. We got on the phone and we made some really important connections. With 40% of Kentuckians unemployed right now, we are seeing a 30% increase with the number of Kentuckians going to our food banks and food pantries. 30% increase. And, and of, the, of that 30% increase, most of them have never had to go to a food pantry before in their life. It is so, so important that we take care of our brothers and sisters in Kentucky. And that's why within weeks, Kentucky Farm Bureau stepped up to the plate and donated a half million dollars to the Kentucky Hunger Initiative. We had other anonymous donations. And this money is being used to buy Kentucky Proud products from our farmers. And those products go directly back to our food banks and so not only is it helping our farmers have an additional market, but for those out of work, those who may need a little extra help putting food on their table, they have the dignity of having high quality, nutritious food uh, through the food banks on their table. And that for me was a personal win. And here are a couple of cool things that we've done with not only donations, but also, um, also with the money that's been donated. We've had over 13,000 Kentucky Proud hamburgers uh, put into our food bank. Uh, 10,000 plus pounds of Purnell's Old Folks Country Sausage. You know that one. It's good there over in Simpsonville. Over 10,000 pounds of Purnell sausage going through our food banks. Uh, we've also had uh, over 100,000 slices of cheese, over 560,000 eggs, two semi-trucks worth of eggs completely donated at no cost to our food banks. Uh, Poultry is our number one our number one uh, ag commodity in Kentucky. And so we're really happy with that. Tomorrow I'm gonna be on the road. Uh, we've had 56 chest freezers donated. A lot of our food banks don't have freezer space. And so I'm gonna be on the road in Eastern Kentucky donating and delivering uh, freezers tomorrow. And so this has been an opportunity to showcase Kentucky's generosity uh, during a, a once in three generation global pandemic. And we wanna make sure that the message is clear once again, that if people that you know may have a little trouble getting food on their table, call your local food pantry, call your local food bank. I know that uh, the Rotary Club 
uh, cares and is in part, uh, part of the solution here. And so we're gonna make sure we take care of those less fortunate. Now, moving forward, what have we learned in 2020? Well, first off, uh, you never know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, two weeks ago, I got a phone call from a, a, a lady I know in my hometown said, I've got some seeds in the mail from China that I didn't order. And I was like, oh gosh, I know exactly what this is because we had heard about this in Washington State, we heard about it in Utah, in Virginia. And so I spent a Sunday afternoon picking up seeds from China. We didn't know what they are. And turns out, as of today, over 30 states have had unsolicited seeds sent to residents, the people who did not order them. And so one thing we learned in 2020, it's kind of like one of those infomercials late at night when you're watching cable TV, they're trying to sell you that knife set that you really don't need, but you kind of want. And the guy gets on and says, but wait, there's more. That's what happens every single day in 2020. But wait, there's more. And so for the, the foreign seed issue, we've had over 500 Kentuckians uh, report foreign seeds. We think, we think it's harmless. We think it's an internet scheme. But if you ever seen kudzu in Eastern Kentucky, or if you ever heard about Asian carp in Western Kentucky lakes, uh, we don't need to introduce new species, unknown species to our environment. We, we want to keep our environment geared towards conservation and agriculture. And so every day there's something different going on. But I think the biggest lesson learned in COVID-19 for us, particularly in rural Kentucky, is the absolute necessity of high-speed broadband internet. And with a lot of kids learning from home, even right there in downtown Louisville, not everyone has access to internet or internet that, that you can conduct business on or learn from home on. It is time for Kentucky to make the strategic investments in the making sure that high-speed broadband internet is available to anybody. Whether you're in an urban area or out the end of a dusty road somewhere in rural Kentucky, we have to have it. And so we are working hard to help push for this. Uh, there are some CARES Act funding. There's some USDA funding. And so we're working with uh, others across the state to make sure that we advocate that this is something that we need, especially if kids are gonna be learning from home. We also wanna make sure that kids have access to food this fall. If kids don't have access to nutritious breakfast or lunch, the last thing in their mind is learning. And, and look, our education system, they got some tough choices ahead of them. They have some tough choices ahead of them. And if a kid doesn't have access to nutrition, it's only gonna make the problem worse. And so we've gotta make sure we have access to food across, uh, across uh, Kentucky, whether in downtown Louisville or Fulton County or Pike County, we've gotta do it. And the last lesson learned, the last thing lesson learned with COVID-19 is that if you know a farmer, say thank you, say thank you. That, that despite a temporary increase in food prices at our grocery stores, despite uh, some disruptions in our food supply chain. Uh, we are the envy of the world. Uh, we, uh, we are able to export agricultural products around the world, and we don't face famine in the United States. With the exception of the Great Depression, the Civil War, and some other very static events in our nation's history, we were not a nation that had, to, that, that had a, a starving population. And look at what's going on in Venezuela right now. Even pre-pandemic, uh, the average citizen has lost 25 pounds because they didn't have access to food. Um, and if you look at the course of human history, um, it is the success of our farming community that allows for investments in other areas. And so I want to conclude my remarks today about uh, supporting local agriculture, going to your farmer's market, saying thanks to the Kentucky farmer. Uh, I would normally say come out to the state fair, but, but you know, maybe make a Facebook post or a tweet saying, we're glad to have you in our town, even if we have to stay six feet away. It's a big deal for us. And so with that, I'm honored to be with you and happy to answer any questions and have a discussion or two. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We have a few questions. Um, this is from Tracy Holliday. Uh, he says, I understand many farmers around the country have supplemented their income with wind farms. Are Kentucky farmers doing the same? And if so, is it growing? When it comes to wind farms, there's really not a big presence in rural Kentucky. Uh, we do know that there were, there were some initiatives, uh, but 
as far as I know, there has not really been a big push uh, for wind farms in Kentucky. But I do know that that there are some in the ag community that would that would welcome uh, ways to not only supplement income but also reduce their energy bills. You know, when we <laughs> when we have a poultry barn or if we're running equipment, it's a big uh, energy input is a big cost for us. So we actually have a grant program using that tobacco settlement money for farmers that want to install solar panels on top of their, say, chicken barns or livestock or dairy barns. We actually have a small uh, incentive program that encourages that. And so agriculture is actually part of the solution. We're, we're conservation oriented. Uh, that lush uh, green pasture land you see across Kentucky, that's, that's, that's sequestering carbon into the soil. And uh, we are more conservation oriented now than ever before. And if you look at our statistics about what it cost in terms of fertilizers or inputs uh, compared to 30 years ago, we are, we are on the right path towards sustainability. Still some work to do, but, but we care about the environment. Very interesting. Um, we heard a lot about hemp um, this past few years. So could you share a little bit about where that stands today and are there more policies that need to be passed to make this really a fruitful industry for Kentucky? The story of hemp is one as, as, as old as Kentucky itself. Uh, it, I just finished writing a, a legal journal article about this and we kind of cover the history. It's been around Kentucky for well over 200 years and, and the history of hemp is up and down, up and down. And for the past 70 years, since World War II, when, when my grandfather grew hemp for the US Navy, it's been illegal to grow. And so 2014 all the way up to 2018 was an experimental process uh, there's a lot of curiosity about this crop. Kentucky is a natural home for hemp and hemp processing. And so there's a lot of promise. And then in 2018, with the passage of the, the newest farm bill uh, and our, our strong congressional delegation, which pushed for this, uh, hemp was once again legal in America. However, in 2019, with it being legal across the United States, uh, production soared. And unfortunately, uh, for a lot of folks uh, in the hemp industry, uh, we're really good at growing crops in Kentucky, mm -hmm. but our production capacity was not able to meet the supply capacity. So 2019 was somewhat of a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some uh, con contractions in the market and there were some processors uh, that got their, their kind of uh, head over, over their toes and they were, uh, got themselves in some financial situations that were regrettable. However, in 2020, uh, we will have hemp in Kentucky. Uh, we expect there to be about 5,000 acres grown this year. Uh, uh, about 500 farmers will be growing this. Many of those farmers, it's a first time experience. And so one thing that we tell everybody, ever since uh, day one serving as ag commissioner is be cautious, start small. There's still a lot that needs to be figured out about this crop. We need guidance from the FDA, the FDA, uh, is being a little bit slow, in my opinion, with helping us out with determining what products can be on the shelves. Uh, we've had some other glitches in the system that we're working through, but I do believe there will be a long-term hemp market in Kentucky. Uh, 2019 was a breakout year, but it was also a year that a lot of folks uh, uh, were not able to cover their production expenses. And so uh, we are working with them on an individual manner, but we think that long-term there will be a hemp market in Kentucky, um, but we still have a lot of things we got to work out, including the FDA, which, which again, uh, hemp has been legal in America uh, for several years now. It's time for them to give us clarification on what can be legally sold. But I think there's great potential uh, with the nutraceutical and, and perhaps what we think are some healthcare benefits from hemp. And so we're going to keep pushing forward. It may not be a crop for everybody. But again, uh, it's one that attracts a lot of attention and a lot of curiosity. Yes. Um, is there some research happening here in Kentucky tied with that at UK or U of L? Or yeah, we were fortunate that uh, Leader McConnell actually was able to get uh, significant funding uh, for some hemp research centers, uh, not just in Kentucky but other states. But but we expect our research to continue to move forward, not only on the production side but also on the material side. I mean. Imagine, imagine the day. We're a big manufacturing state. Uh, you know, the only sector of our economy that's bigger than agriculture is manufacturing. Imagine the day when, when our, our farm economy is saying using CANAF 
or using hemp or other crops, growing sustainable green products that could go into car parts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that hemp's being used in concrete. Uh, it was used in a bridge repair uh, two summers ago. And so we hope that there's more emphasis on the fiber and seed side of hemp. There's, there's been, we've been so dominated on the CBD side, but it's important to know that uh, despite some uh, market corrections, we're gonna continue with the research and U of L is participating in this as well as UK. All right, so stay tuned, it sounds like, yes. Um, many years ago, I guess it, part of the tobacco settlement time, there was a real emphasis on farmers diversifying their crops and we saw the wine industry really um, accelerate here. Can you touch on that? Yeah, our wine industry, uh, again, just like hemp, there was a period where it was actually not legal to have a farm winery after World War II. And a lot of it goes back to prohibition-esque uh, policies. But today we have around 70 farm wineries across Kentucky. They are a tourist attraction. And one of the cool things is that we're a big bourbon state. Uh, people come to, come to Kentucky to experience our horses, our bourbon. And now they're adding an extra day for our wine too. We actually have a guy on our staff who I think has the best job in state government. He's the state winemaker. That is his job. And he actually has a certification that only about 300 people in the world have. And he's out there working with our, with our venture culturalist and our, our wine producers to, to try to push us up into the next level. And for those of you all who may be history buffs, uh, Kentucky is actually the second biggest wine producing state in the country until World War II. And Kentucky is actually home to the oldest commercial vineyard in our country, in the United States, uh, down in the Jessamine Fayette County line. A lot of folks don't realize that, but uh, we have a long way to go. But the cool thing is that we're working with the bourbon industry. Uh, and so whenever we can open back up and welcome people back into our state, in a meaningful, meaningful way, it's gonna be part of our agritourism network. So there was some, some um, passage of, you could actually buy the product at the places. Does that also uh, go with the wine industry as well? I'd have to check on that. No, there's a lot of different laws when it comes to alcohol in Kentucky, but, uh -huh. but we wanna make it as uh, farmer friendly as possible. Yeah. And if it comes to be able to do direct shipments and, uh, tastings, et cetera. We want to make sure that our farmers have the same ability to do that. Right. Uh, Rotarians, if anyone else has a question, if you, at the bottom of your um, screen there, there's a place where you can type something in, or if you just want to unmute and ask Commissioner Quarles yourself, we welcome you to do that. Um, it's just, I could go on and on with my own questions. <laughs> Anybody else have questions for him? Ryan, it's uh, Mac McClure. And I was wondering, uh, App Harvest and some of the other large new greenhouse ventures, along with some people from Holland, mm -hmm. what's that going to look like and what kind of dollar amounts are we looking at as far as crop production? Yeah, so Kentucky has about four large scale greenhouses, which are either under construction or planned to be constructed. And if you ever get a chance, to uh, travel to Europe, uh, particularly the Netherlands, which is, you know, the Netherlands are a relatively small country, but they're the biggest exporter of ag goods in Europe. A lot of it's, a lot of the food's being grown underneath glass with greenhouses. And so App Harvest, uh, they've been around for some time. I've actually been working with App Harvest since 2017. They originally were looking at Pike County. And I remember Governor Patton, myself and Jonathan Webb driving up on top of some reclaimed coal mine land, looking at potential sites. Uh, we've been working on this for years, but they eventually called Moorhead home to their first facility. It is a 60 acre greenhouse. And mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know how big of an acre is, it's about the size of a football field. So imagine 60 of those lined up, connected. It's the largest greenhouse in North America. And uh, they plan on producing uh, what I believe will be tomatoes, but they may have some other crops in the works. And you know the timing seems pretty favorable right now with, with COVID-19 shining some light on, on the need for local agriculture. This is, this is a $150 million investment, $150 million. And so we're, we're interested in seeing where App Harvest and these other large scale uh, investments are gonna go. Uh, I think it's important that we, we keep things in, in perspective 
It's also important that we make sure that we don't compete against local farmers at farmers markets. And so we have had some discussion um, about, you know, our business plans, but I think it's neat that, that Kentucky, in my vision, should be the Silicon hauler for agriculture technology. And we have other companies uh, like Danamir Scientific in Winchester, which is producing biodegradable plastics uh, that, that if they end up in a landfill, they biodegrade within one year. Uh, if they end up in the ocean, they biodegrade even quicker. And so we have some technology that's being produced right here in Kentucky. It's pretty cool. We actually had a, a company send uh, some Kentucky hemp seeds to the International Space Station last year uh, for, uh, for microgravity gravity, uh, experiments. And so it's pretty cool. Uh, we, have a, we have a chia farmer down in South Central Kentucky. It's the largest chia farm in North America. And we think that could be another superfood that could be bought and, and used in uh, at Whole Foods, et cetera. And so the research is happening here because we have a strong research apparatus with our, with our regionals like Murray State, Western, Moorhead, Eastern Kentucky, et cetera. UK and KSU have strong ag programs, but it's our cooperative extension office that really helps us out. And even Jefferson County has a cooperative extension office, which helps connect our urban and rural populations. And so App Harvest is really neat. It's one of many, and we're excited to see what happens next. Commissioner, uh, this is Dan Hartledge. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the need for statewide rural internet and farm communities and the like. Could you explain that a little further? And, and, uh, and, and where does Kentucky Wired come into that whole, um, you know, into that whole mix? Well, you know, advocating for rural broadband internet is nothing new. It's one of those issues that everybody's for, but they don't know what it means. And uh, you, you talk with someone, it's kind of like tax reform. Everyone says, yeah, we need tax reform. But once you start throwing a proposal out there, there's going to be disagreements on how you move forward. And so to the best of my ability, uh, I think that this is a conversation that's being driven by the, by the General Assembly. I know Kentucky Farm Bureau has, has made this one of their major priorities, and it should be. And I think it's something that the school systems are going to play a vital role in because, again, if we're going to be learning at home, we need to make sure that every child has access to the materials that they need to move forward. Uh, to answer your question about Kentucky Wired, you know, that, that's a situation that I'm still learning a little bit more about. Uh, it's my understand, they, it's understanding that Kentucky Wired will play a role. And they have a big footprint in eastern Kentucky already, and they've made some progress. I know Hal Rogers has been really active on this. But I think, I think it's going to take uh, many different people, many different organizations coming together uh, with a, we don't, I don't, I don't think a one size fits all solution is going to work because every county is a little bit different and some counties are quite far ahead than others when it comes to this. But at the end of the day, we need to treat access to broadband internet the same way our grandparents treated electricity back in the 30s and 40s is that we got to electrify Kentucky uh, in a very similar way and uh, time time is now to do it. Well, uh, Kevin Lynch, uh, wondering what percentage of the uh, workforce is uh, of the farm workforce is in corporate farms as opposed to family farms? The same question about acreage, both the okay. U.S. and Kentucky if you have it and also I could see clear differences but where does it where does it sort of where's the line drawn between what's corporate and what's a family farm? I'm glad to get a great Jeopardy question today. And uh, <laughs> the answer is, uh, what is 95%? 95% of our farms are family owned. Family owned. So the corporate, the corporate agriculture presence is actually quite small in Kentucky. We're a small family farm state. Our average farm size is only about 170 acres, whereas the national farm size is almost 500. And so for Kentucky, uh, we do have the large farms. Uh, once you get past E-Town, but we're, we're a small family farm state. And that's what makes me so proud that we got everything from apples to zucchinis and everything in between. And when you look at our acreage, I believe the acreage would probably come down about the same uh, markdown when it comes to what's corporate versus what's, uh, what's family owned. And, and, and one of the neat things is that uh, our family farms, we have 76,000 of them in Kentucky those are 76,000 small businesses. And it's so important that you look at farms as small businesses because that's what they are. And they employ people. We employ 200,000 people across our state. Again, the manufacturing sector 
is the only mm-hmm. sector of Kentucky's economy that, that employs more people. And that's like the Toyotas, the Fords, the GMs, et cetera. On the national scale, I think I'd have to brush up on my statistics a little bit more. Uh, I, obviously, Kentucky has a higher percentage of family-owned versus corporate in the country, but I really couldn't give you that answer off the top of my head. But, but I think it's a good thing that our family farmers are, are the ones that give us our diversity and variety in Kentucky agriculture. And if you ever want to uh, see that, go to a farmer's market on Saturday morning. They're more than happy to tell you their story. Mr. Secretary, it's Larry Sloan. And uh, I'm uh, asking a question along those same lines. What percentage would you say of the available good farmland in Kentucky is lying fallow? I'm just curious as to what the potential growth could be for our agricultural output. Great question. So Kentucky has about 24 million acres. Um, half of that acreage is in trees and the other half is in, is in farmland. And, and so we're a, we're a rolling, rolling hill state. You know, we're yet to get out to Western Kentucky to really see the flat stuff. And so when you talk about what's laying fallow, that really is kind of a double-edged term because to me, uh, a lot of that land may be in hay production, but it may not be in high quality hay production. And so uh, it is being harvested uh, for livestock feed, but, but instead of it being grass hay, maybe make the investment and make it clover or alfalfa hay. We can get a, a higher premium. And that's one thing our farm has done. We've actually converted some of our tobacco land into alfalfa production that sells straight to the horse industry because we know we're going to have a strong buyer at the end of the day. But to answer your question, um, if you ever get a chance to go to Japan, uh, they'll have rice paddies right next to a skyscraper. We have a lot of land in America, but we also need to make sure that we're conservation oriented. And one, one thing that is affecting, I think, central Kentucky a little bit more than other areas is our, our prime farmland is being gobbled up by developers. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you need to stop and think about what the long-term effect is of uh, high quality, high producing land in Kentucky. But the good thing is this, whether you own one acre or a thousand acres, uh, it doesn't take a lot of land to grow some food. And so there, we do have programs that help particularly younger farmers transition into agriculture. Uh, you have a young man on your program today that has about 27 acres. And if you're, if you're growing organics, that's plenty of land. And so, uh, we want to put that land in, into productive use, or if it's laying fallow, make sure that it's used, being used for conservation practices. And, and I know time is of the essence. I want to, I want to mention one last statistic that I want to uh, drop on you all here at the end. 40% of Louisville's farmers are age 65 or older, mm. 40%. And, and that's retirement age. That's the average age. And so we have got to get young folks interested in not just the production of agriculture, but also the new cool companies that we need to have to make sure that with a rising global population, we're about 7.8 billion people on earth right now. We're going to hit 9.5 billion uh, here in about two decades. We've got to increase our food production while also be mindful of the environment. And we've got to get young people involved. And so my, my recommendation to you is when things get back to normal, um, support uh, Louisville Jefferson County Farm Bureau's Ag Days. They, they do a lot of uh, outreach to the school systems as well as the Cooperative Extension. And if you all want to be active in that, just let me know. But we've got to get young people uh, looking at agriculture as a career option. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I I tell you what, we're really, really honored to have you, Commissioner, and thank you so much for your leadership and for all you do for Kentucky and especially the small farmers that really are so important to our our organizations of how we um, really move forward as a state and the culture that it represents as well. And Mikey, having you on the call today, boy, is that an inspiration. We really appreciate it, talking about a young farmer in the future. So um, with the time being what it is, we're going to call this meeting adjourned and thank everyone so very much. Um, Those that are interested in learning more about Rotary, please stay on the call and we'll have our What is Rotary session immediately following. Thank you. Thank you.